This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to Aquarium Mania. I'm your host, Dr. Roy Anong, speaking to you from the University of Florida IFAS Tropical Aquaculture Laboratory. Thanks for joining us. We often use the term fish out of water to describe someone who's completely out of their element. But believe it or not, many fish have evolved with the biology, cues, and behaviors needed to move onto land and survive for long periods of time when necessary. My guest today, Dr. Noah Bressman, is an avid fisherman, artist, blogger, and assistant professor of physiology at Salisbury University in Maryland. Noah has studied a number of these so-called amphibious fishes, some of which are invasive, for many years. Join us as Noah explains just how they do it and why. We'll be right back after these messages. How many of you have pets? My hand's raised. Now think about how lucky you are to have such a sweet little pet in your life. And that pet is lucky to have you too. But unfortunately, there are countless pets out there that don't have a home to call their own. However, Bob's from Skechers is trying to change that. So we developed Bob's for dogs and cats to help pets in need. With every purchase of adorable Bob's footwear or fun, stylish apparel, or even the cutest Bob's pet accessories, Skechers makes a donation to Petco Love to help save shelter pets. And with your help, we've already saved the lives of over 1 million pets and raised over $7 million. So while you're getting style and comfort with features like Skechers' famous memory foam cushioning, you're also helping to save an adorable pet in need and helping another lucky owner be connected with a future best friend and companion because happiness is having a loving pet by your side. Find Bob's at a Skechers store, Skechers.com, select pet co-locations, or wherever stylish footwear is sold. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Aquarium Mania on Pet Life Radio. My guest today is Dr. Noah Bressman, Assistant Professor of Physiology at Salisbury University in Maryland. Noah, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Roy. So uh, I had the opportunity to uh, kind of meet you a number a couple of years ago. You were doing some really, really cool work, and now you're sort of like starting to, on your path to becoming a big wig. But before we talk about some of the work you're doing and have been doing, uh, let's talk a little history. How did you first get interested in fish? And you know, was it through aquariums, fishing, or a different way? Well, I, there was not really any way I got interested in fish in that I was born in fish, like. I remember going back second grade book report while people were doing Captain Underpants and stuff. I did my second grade book report on the Audubon's first field guide to fish, where I held up the field guide. I pointed to a fish in the class. I gave a description of the fish, where it's found, and a fun fact. And I just did that for like 10 different fish. So I was just born and I loved fish. And I, I just always wrote about fish to the point where I found like recently like a third grade assignment where the teacher wrote like, this is nice, but you got to stop writing about fish. And here I am still writing about fish for a living now. So I grew up doing aquarium, like having a home aquarium where I'm breeding fish. And I had like 12 fish tanks in my house at one point where I was like doing research projects in my own house in like middle school. And I was interested in fishing because that was another way to interact with fish. And so I just, my whole life has just been 24 seven fish, but there's not really any reason for it. My, my dad's a, a lawyer and my mom did some business stuff and was an educator, but there's no reason I should like fish, but I do because they're awesome. And why wouldn't anybody like fish? Maybe like at a critical point during your mom's pregnancy, she ate a lot of fish. You know, maybe that was, that might've been it. That could be it. Or I found like recently, like when my parents are cleaning out their house and moving, they found like early on in the house before they did renovations, my mom painted like these different types of salmon and trout, like all along the walls. Uh, like the kitchen and they cut one of those ones out and like framed it in one of the old cabinets and I found it. Maybe that's when I was like two years old before it was redone. I did some subliminal messaging into my brain and that's, <laughs> that's cool, man. So um, I guess moving a little bit even further beyond the really, really early kind of memories. Do you remember any early influences that guided you more toward specific fish biology and behavior? So there was one thing that guided me to more into more 
towards fish biology rather than being coming like a commercial fisherman or aquarist or something related to fish outside of fish research. And I remember I was doing some some work in actually in, in around Tampa Bay in Florida. I was doing a summer fishing camp and it was really cool catching all these giant fish and seeing all these giant fish. But I would some, see some people just like they would catch a giant fish, kill it to take a photo with it and just like toss it back dead in the ocean or throw it out. And I was like, that doesn't seem right. I was like, we should we should learn more about these fish instead of like wasting like these precious natural resources. We should learn more about fish. And that kind of connected me to like fish biology where I'm like, I don't want to be part of some destruction. I want to be part of like the solution. And I'm not trying to badmouth fishermen. I go fishing all the time. I, my freezer is filled with fish. It's just kind of doing it responsibly. I, I got into and I figured fish biology was a way I could help learn how to inform others on how to do things like that responsibly. But specifically, I got into fish behavior and just that I grew up and I just loved watching my fish tank. I would just watch the fish interact for like hours on end and i'd like put new fish and like oh these fish are breeding and i'm like look at that and then this one like these like kissing grammys were i guess kissing in their display where they kind of clasp lips and i just thought that was fascinating and shark week i was like oh shark week's awesome i want to study some big sharks jumping out of the water eating seals that sounds awesome and so the behavioral aspect is always what captured me but i thought i'd do something like shark week big flashy behavioral shark stuff or a behavior of predatory fish because like oh i could i could go fishing and do that as research but then while i was a, a freshman at, in college at, at cornell i took a summer marine biology course at shoals marine lab in maine where it was like a two-week intensive field course where you're immersed in marine biology 24 7 and first half of the course you kind of learn some background is on marine uh, anatomy and function of marine vertebrates. So I learned some background information about this. And then we had to do like a week long research project. And I thought, I'm like, how can I do something about fish predatory behavior, something like that, big flashy stuff. And then while I'm thinking about that, like I pretty much see a, a little fish called a mummy chug, two inch long killifish species that's found along the East Coast, uh, Fundulus uh, heteroclitus, super common fish. It was like 10 feet away from me in the hallway. I'm like, how'd you get there? Like I was, it's in my brain started thinking like if a fish were to jump out of the fish tank, you would expect it to flop around randomly and probably end up somewhere dead around the bottom of the tank, maybe a few feet away. But this tiny little fish, like it seems like move in a non-random fashion. I thought, okay, this is odd. It's also still alive, which is odd because it seemed to have jumped out overnight. But I put it back in the fish tank. It could have been a coincidence. The next day, there was another mummy chug in the exact same spot, 10 feet away on the ground. I'm like, okay, hold up. Something's going on here. This is not a coincidence. And I just did like a little few experiments on that for my week long project as part of the course and found that like we had like a, a very low powered high speed camera, but still slowed it down enough to see that they're doing these orientation behaviors and they can actually jump in a controlled manner. And they're actually moving. Like if you put them next to water, they can actually move towards water. And I was like, this is interesting. Like I want to learn more about like, why are they moving towards water? And so I worked with the TA. We we got a small, very small grant, just enough to basically fund me to come back to the island for a couple of weeks the next summer. And I did some more experiments where very simple experiments, turning the the light off, seeing if they can orient without light, and found that like they use vision to find their way around on land. And then more specifically, I thought like if you're using vision to find water while you're on land as a fish, what's the visual cue of water like that gives it the most away and i'm like it's probably reflection like water is pretty reflective so it, it could be reflection so I, I replaced the water with aluminum foil and these mummy chugs they moved towards the foil just as strongly as if it was water if not even a little bit more and so i'm like these fish are moving towards the reflection which brings me back to the very beginning of how that fish was in the hallway it must have just jumped out overnight there may have been a bigger fish trying to eat it in the fish tank and then the sun came up and the spot that those two mummy chugs were was on the shiny tile floor where the sunlight sh first shined in the morning. And so that they're shining on that nice shiny spot where they thought it was a puddle. And so they moved towards that thinking it was water. And that's when all these aha moments clicked. I'm like, wow, like I came up with this. It wasn't about predatory fish stuff, but I made a real world observation. I was genuinely interested in it. I asked questions on how to do it. I create experiments to test that. And I was able to like discover something that nobody else knew in the world. And then I got to write it up and share it and like tell the whole world about it. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. I'm hooked. Like I'm studying amphibious fish for the rest of my life because it's awesome. And so then I started studying more amphibious fish because of that. But going full circle, now that I'm a professor, I'm still doing amphibious fish stuff, but I realized I'm in charge of my own lab. I can do what I want. And so I want to do some projects on some predatory fish behavior and some recreational fish 
anything that can involve me going fishing for research, I'm going to start thinking of those projects. That's cool, man. Yeah, that, that is pretty interesting. So unfortunately, the fish were like looking at essentially at a fish mirage, it sounds like, <laughs> as they were, they were uh, going to dry up eventually. Exactly. So, uh, but, but you saved them. So that kind of got you through Cornell. And then that's when you pretty much decided you wanted to go to grad school. And, and so how did you decide where to go and who to work with? So I did some other work uh, after that Mummy Chug project. I did that work with uh, Stacey Farina and Willie Bemis at Cornell. Willie's still a professor at Cornell and Stacey's a professor at Howard University. And then I got people recommending like, oh, you should do this summer I- internship program uh, with Dr. Alice Gibb and Stacey Farina uh, at Friday Harbor Labs on more amphibious fish. And I did that. I'm like, I'm still hooked. And so I was like, I'm going to do my PhD on amphibious fish. And there's not that many people that studied amphibious fish. So I guess the numbers are growing each day now that the people that do study them teach other people, but there weren't that many labs that study amphibious fish. And so I reached, I reached out to a few of the PIs that study that and applied to their labs. And then I had to decide which lab to go to. And I just felt that I felt the, the most kind of at home comfortable. Like I feel like I'd be the best well off at the program at Wake Forest University with Dr. Miriam Ashley Ross, which is my PhD advisor, and we we worked well together. Uh, but it was is really a factor of there's not many options if I want to study amphibious fish. Here are the few people. Of those few people, who do I work best with, and which program do I feel myself being most successful? And and so that's how I found myself at Wake Forest. Uh, but I, I had a, a great time. Great. I like to think a very successful PhD at Wake Forest. And those fish projects that I started doing there ended up bringing me down to to meet you at, at the U.S. facility down there when I was doing my walking catfish and then pleco research after that as well. Yeah, and that was pretty interesting when uh, when we met and you kind of told me what you're doing. And uh, yeah, it's cool. It's cool kind of seeing where you've come from and where you're going. So uh, now I'm going to kind of transition into uh, what I'm, I'm going to call the, our surf and turf fishes, but you call them amphibious. Um, can, can you maybe uh, give a, a quick overview of what that means. But what, before I say that, though, I do have to say, and I think I mentioned to you, I checked out your Wix site, saw your TED Ed talk, The Fish That Walk on Land, which was really cool. Great animation. You did great narration on that. It definitely was kind of Dr. Susie versus horror, but I really liked it. So yeah, let's let's go back and can you explain what you mean by amphibious fishes? Okay. So amphibious fish, I mean, it's, it's a loose definition. Although actually there was a, a great paper that came out Last night, a review paper by Dr. Andy Turco and some other people from the Patricia Wright Lab, kind of defining the spectrum of amphibiousness from like the least amphibious to the most amphibious fish. And they actually created criteria to to classify that. And I recommend checking that out if you're interested in that. But by amphibious fish, I mean a fish that that either spends some time of its life or does some behavior on land. And it could be as simple as there's a frog on the shore. You jump onto land to grab that frog and come back in versus living in a log for months at a time. There's a whole spectrum and it's not just one category and there's different fish do it in different ways. Some fish that are amphibious can't breathe air and those are generally like limited to very little time on land. So you may have something like a California grunion, which will really only come on land one time in its life. And that's under the light of the full moon to spawn on the beaches. And a few minutes later, it goes back in the water. And that's just kind of get the eggs away from aquatic predators while they're spawning. Although birds will take advantage of that, but it seems to be their strategy. And then towards the all the way towards the other end, you have things like walking catfish, which have an actual air breathing organ and are called walking catfish because they can move very well over land. And they're thought to be able to move uh, potentially even over one kilometer at a time over land. And so that's a whole different end of the spectrum. But even further than that is you have things like lungfish that'll estivate or more like hibernate in the mud on land for years at a time. And things like the mangrove rivulus, which you have down in the Florida Keys and the Caribbean that will live in crab burrows or even moist logs on land for months at a time. And so amphibious, you don't have to be the most amphibious fish. You don't have to come onto land all day long. You just have to do come on land or have the capability of coming on land at some time. So there may be an amphibious fish that never comes on land its entire life just because it's never had to. It may just be conditions were good, so it never had to leave the water. Whereas other amphibious fish, even the same species, 
may come onto land more often in a different population where they'll say there's predators chasing them onto the land, aquatic predators chasing them out of the water, or you have like poor water quality, which causes them to leave the water in search of better water quality. And so even within the same species, there could be a spectrum of terrestriality just based on the environment that they're in. So let's kind of start looking at a couple of these a little more closely, and maybe we'll talk about one before the break. One that I actually learned about years ago and is definitely fascinating, and we actually do have them up you know, around St. Pete in this area, is the uh, mangrove rivulus, which at the time had a different genus and species, but it is a, a bizarre fish in a lot of ways. Why don't you kind of tell us a little bit about Cryptolibis marmoratus, uh, why it's a little weird, and then also then you know obviously talk about its kind of amphibiousness as well. So I wouldn't say they're just a little weird. They're all they're a lot of weird. Uh, they <laughs> definitely yeah, yeah, they are one of the only I think two simultaneous self fertilizing hermaphrodite fish, and by that I mean there are some other fish that will change sex from male to female or female to male, or they'll have both male and female gonads at the same time. But usually when that happens, when they have them at the same time, they'll exchange, like, one will give, lay its eggs, the other one will fertilize the eggs, and then they'll, they'll switch that around. But the mangrove rivulus will fertilize its own egg. And so they're essentially cloning themselves. And so they have these, like, very similar genetic lines. And you can take them from different populations where they have different genetic strains. And you can, it's great for getting a sample size when you have, like, pretty much genetically identical animals over and over and over and over. And you could like, genetics does not factor into this uh, experiment as a control because there's no genetic diversity, assuming you're using the same strains. But if they get stressed, they will irreversibly change to a male where their color will change from like a drab kind of brownish, just a bland drab fish color to a bright orange. And they can never change back. But nobody has really ever seen them in the lab, the hermaphrodites mating with the males. So the question is, what are the males doing? Why go to the mail? I understand if you're stressed, eggs are costly to make. So stop making eggs is a way to save some energy. But so some thoughts are that maybe the males will go fertilize unfertilized eggs that happen to not get fertilized by the hermaphrodites when they fertilize their own eggs. But not only that, they live in like often mangrove forests and in specifically in like crab burrows, like that are like in intertidal crab burrows that are just like inches wide, a few inches deep. And they're totally happy there. They can live in completely like water with no oxygen. They can live in really hot, really bad conditions. And so because they're pretty much indestructible, they'll even live in a, a, a damp log for months at a time. Uh, as long as they're kept moist, they can breathe air through their skin and perhaps through their gills and uh, swim bladder. Uh, but they're small enough that when you're really small, you have very sm uh, large surface area to volume ratio. So you can get a lot of oxygen just diffusing straight through your skin. But these fish can move around on land. They'll pounce on prey on land, but they're like little crickets and stuff. But they'll have to bring those the, that prey into the water to swallow, to, the physics of the water to help them swallow. But because they're so adapted to land, they're great fish to study for uh, like evolution of life from water to land, evolution of extreme physiology to survive in these crazy conditions. And they're so easy to have in the lab because they're used to these crab burrows. You put them in a little like one pint Tupperware container with a little bit of water and like a cotton ball for them to come out onto if they want to. You don't need to change the water for weeks or months at a time because they like it when it gets covered in algae and it gets disgusting looking because that's what they're used to. So they're just great to work with and just fascinating all around the board and can't wait to do some more work with them. I think you had one paper on uh, working with those, right? What was your kind of main focus on that? And, and maybe briefly explain like how you did the, the research. This is my first chapter of my dissertation on Wake Forest, and it was an expansion of my work on mummy chugs, where I did that orientation work where there's there was very little work on how fish orient in a terrestrial environment, because when people think of how fish use senses, they're like, oh, we're going to look at how fish use senses in the water. And so very simply, I wanted to figure out, okay, I know mummy chugs, they use vision, and they look for reflections on land. What other cues do amphibious fish use to move around on land and do other amphibious fish use vision and so that's why i was like we got all these mangrove rivulets in the lab at wake forest already when i got there let's see if they use vision basic things like that and so i simply had a setup where i had this like kiddie pool this plastic kiddie pool that was empty that i'll just put a, a fish in the center on a cup and i'll like have the cup on a pulley and i'll pull the cup up so it's straight up so it doesn't they don't move or like the cup doesn't influence the direction of their initial movements 
and I would film from above and just see which direction they go. But I noticed something interesting while I was doing these experiments. I was originally in the room when I was doing these experiments, and I'd pull the cup and watch from one end of the, the tank, and then all the fish would go to the other end of the tank. I'm like, let me just see what's going on. So I go on the other side of the tank and do those same experiments, and the fish move away from me again. I'm like, well, clearly they're using vision because they can see me. And so I'm going to step out of the room and like have the pulley through, uh, pulled through like the door outside of the room. And I watch remotely on my, uh, through a GoPro on my phone, like live streaming it, and I could see what they're doing. And then in that control, they started moving randomly. And I'm like, okay, my presence has an influence on them, which was interesting. And then I, went, I did some other experiments where I was testing like, can they move towards oil, water? So I put like water in one quadrant of the kiddie pool to see if they move towards that more than the other quadrants. I would do things like, what colors do they prefer? Like simple contrast things like spray one side black, spray one side white. They can move towards the water and they chose the, I believe the, the white coloration more. And that could be because white's more reflective or maybe they want to feel like they're in a more open habitat rather than a, a dark shady habitat where they don't know anything's there. I did some experiments where like, can, will they like, do they have preference and can they orient uphill or downhill and tilt the kiddie pool and they, they move downhill seem to, whether they're going with gravity or like they're intentionally working with gravity is, is still unknown, but they seem to be able to continuously reorient and position downward. But some of them did go up, not a significant number. They significantly moved down the platform, but it shows they had the capability of moving up if they, if they wanted to, but it might as well, if you're trying to go somewhere, you might as well go with the flow and work with gravity to get where you're going. I also did some experiments where I put like an aquarium, like an object to see if they'll use shelter. So I use like an aquarium decoration, a natural one. And interestingly, they moved away from that, but they may have moved away from that just like they moved away from me, thinking it was a unfamiliar object that could have been a predator. But the ones that happened to move close to it immediately made like a beeline for it and like wedged themselves under. So it seems like they may actually be like nearsighted where they can't really tell things what things are from far away, but if they get close, they can inspect them better. I did a couple other uh, treatments, I, I think, and like like the the foil treatment, they move towards reflections again. But this was mostly to see the test if they use the same cues as mummy chose, as well as what other cues are out there. But a really interesting one that I found was on to see can they use color vision to orient on land? And so if you're going to use a, a fish that's pretty drab in color, but the males turn orange, it sounds like the orange would be the get best color to test. And so I exposed them to orange a quadrant. And interestingly, the hermaphrodites showed no significant preference for direction, but the males would go towards the orange quadrant. And so either they were thinking, there's a male over there, I got to go kick his butt and get him out of my territory, just the orange coloration triggering like an aggressive competitive aspect of the fish or perhaps it has an awareness of its own color that's orange and it's trying to camouflage it. so that was an interesting development so definitely want to talk a little bit more about some of the other interesting work you've done but let's take a short break and we'll continue our discussion with my guest noah bressman assistant professor at salisbury university in maryland after these messages take a bite out of your competition Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, Stitcher, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio. PetLifeRadio.com. We're back and continuing our conversation with my guest, Noah Bressman of Salisbury University. So that, yeah, that was really pretty interesting. And um, yeah, I mean, it's such a weird fish to begin with, but yeah, you, you had some really great work with that fish. One of the more famous fish you've worked on is the Northern Snakehead. And uh, although many people have heard of it, I know some of our uh, listeners may not be familiar with us. Can you kind of give us a quick brief on it and then explain some of the work you did? The Northern Snakehead, uh Chana Argus is native to Eastern Asia, I think all the way up from Russia down to into China. And they are, they have an air breathing organ similar to the walking catfish that I talked to, but they're totally unrelated. They're actually 
their sister group are uh, Grammys and Vedas, and so they're they're close to to them. They are and live in really harsh environments that are native uh, to uh, swamps and floodlands where conditions you can get really poor water quality. You can get a series of floods that then dry up and can strand fish in areas. And they they were introduced to the U.S. Um, in the early 2000s. Uh, they they were found uh, first in Crofton Pond in Maryland, and then they started popping up around uh, more of the eastern mid, mid Atlantic states. And now there's populations in Georgia. They entered they're in Arkansas, and they recently entered the Mississippi River. So expect to th- find them all over the country soon. Uh, but they're they're a large predatory fish. They get to about twenty pounds. They have big teeth. They're called snakeheads because their pattern kind of looks like that of a, a Burmese python. And they're pretty elongate fish. And I I grew up listening to them, like, like, like hearing stories about them. Like they first found these fish. They're these monster fish. They're called them Frankenfish. They're like these fish can walk on land. And like they're like you got to watch out. Like you don't let your kids play they'll, uh, near the water. They'll eat your kids. They'll eat your puppy. And that was just missed for a while. And they made, there's at least four or five horror movies to varyingly, varying degrees of terribleness about snakeheads. But some of them are fun, terrible, and some of them are just terrible, terrible. But when I was in, uh, about to start grad school, I, I was thinking of like, I was wanting to apply for the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship to, because that'd be, it's just a great grant that make my, and it did make my grad school a lot more smooth because it funded me and I, I didn't have to TA so I could focus on my research. And I was thinking of projects like I want to do something with amphibious fish, but part of me, like going back to that conservation experience I had earlier, like I wanted hardcore conservation makes me really depressed thinking about everything that's dying and getting destroyed in the world. But I was like, invasive species, I can work with that. Let me think of them. There's these invasive amphibious fish, or at least it's thought to be amphibious. I could ask my amphibious fish questions. I just want to know in general about amphibious fish and work with an invasive species to where not only do I learn more about the water to land transition in in vertebrates, but I could also learn that information in perhaps the conservation and management aspect where let's say you know how far a fish can move over land. You could figure out how far it could could spread from one body of water to another body of water, which is something that's not really factored into these fish's management plans because they're managed like any other fish that you assume they can only spread to bodies of water that they're connected to. And so I was writing this this grant application, I realized still nobody ever separated fact from fiction, the basic thing of can the northern snakehead move over land? I'm like, that's a simple question I could ask right there. And they're a good candidate because they can breathe air. And other, other snakehead species are known to move over land are known to move on land, but the description that was very minor. And I think the most extensive description from that was pretty much, I think like a 1960 cartoon by Walt Disney that simply said, the snakehead will, the vicious and ferocious snakehead will consume everything in a body of water, but it won't suffer from its own greed. They'll simply wriggle over land to the next pond to eat the fish there. And that description of they will wriggle over land to the next pond is pretty much all there is in the literature of how they can actually move over land. So I'm like, can they move over land? How do they do it? But also, like, if I just put them on land, like nobody's really seen them on land. It's mostly fishermen catch them and drop them on land. Like, oh, they're crawling away. They're walking away, whatever they're doing. And that's how they got their reputation for moving on land. I want to know not only can and they move on land, and how they, if they, if so, how, why do they go on to land? And so first I did some experiments where I just put them on the ground and to see, do they move randomly flopping around like your tuna or a bass on a boat or do a more directed movement like a mummy chug where there's a series of jumps or a sculpin that says like an army crawl or a walking catfish that, that, that walk. And so these snakeheads, I put them on the ground they, and they, they did a crawl. They, they're not breaking any speed records, but they move forward. I also noticed, though, I was like, I'm just doing this on basically a flat ground in the lab where most amphibious fish do. do. And I'm like, it's moving very slowly. I wonder if, like, the type of ground it's on affects how it moves. Like, these fish are, you'll have grass and vegetation around on the shoreline. What happens if I put them on grass? Can they move better like that? And I, they can. They can move, like, four or five times faster on grass than they can just on a flat, smooth surface. And it seems to be because they can use their body in, like, a crawling behavior with their pectoral fins to help them push off against the complexity of the ground, the like the grass and the substrates, the, the other complexities of the substrate, where they can have something to push off to and gain purchase. And so it shows that these fish can use their environment to their advantage and that the type of habitat they're in influences how far they can move over land. But then to test how they can, why they come onto land, 
I knew some things of why some other fish come onto land. Like it's known that the mangrove rivulus will come out of water if it's too hot to cool off with evaporative cooling, or if walking catfish are very crowded in a body of water, they may leave the water to go to less crowded area where they have less competition. And so I just put them a bunch of fish tanks with little ramps going through them. Got a lot of little snakeheads and exposed them to a variety of treatments that I thought both that are known to cause some amphibious fish to come on land, but others that may cause these to come on land, like really low water levels or high heat, high salinity, low oxygen, things like that. And I found that unsurprisingly to me, they're known to breathe air because they have an air breathing organ. So they didn't come on land if there's low oxygen because they can just keep gulping air from the surface. They're no problem. They can take advantage of those low oxygen, poor water quality environments. But if the water gets too acidic or too much dissolved carbon dioxide or gets too saline, then they will come onto land uh, vol- of their own, vol- I guess their own volition. Whereas most of the time before people have introduced them on the land, like, oh, I caught them and dropped them on the ground. But that's, I only use a limited sample size uh, for those other treatments, like 12 to 24 fish in an hour long period. Give them weeks at a time in a body of water with no oxygen or that's too hot or overcrowded. Maybe that'll give them more motivation to go on land. But the main question already answered is like, will they voluntarily go on to land? And the answer seems to be yes. So going back to separating fact from fiction, yes, under some conditions, snakeheads will voluntarily go on to land. They're not always coming on to land. They're not frequently doing it. It's a rare behavior. But because they'll actually do it, a rare behavior, all it takes is one snakehead to, or I guess two snakeheads to leave uh, one body of water, enter another watershed and reproduce there to start a whole new population they can then spread. And so I was able to help answer those questions I originally I had as a kid growing up, like, whoa, this frankenfish, like, can it come onto land? Will it eat people? No, it's not going to eat your babies. It's not going to eat your pets. Don't worry about that. Just don't lip them like you would a bass because somebody lost a thumb like that. That's the only way you really get injured by them if, is if you're physically putting your hand in their mouth. But those rare dispersal events where they could come onto land can and may have already happened. And that may have been potentially how they entered from, there was a fish farm in Arkansas. And then eventually there was a population that got loose near there and established themselves in Arkansas. A couple could have escaped. And that's how they're entering the Mississippi River. So it is possible. And it was interesting to really combine amphibious fish with some some aspect of conservation and invasive species work where I felt like I was making that research as important uh, with as much broader impacts as I possibly could to inform the most different areas of science. Yeah, no, that was definitely some great work. So you mentioned uh, coming down and uh, working on walking catfish. And that was kind of like I mentioned earlier, was was really kind of interesting to see what you were doing. Walking catfish, obviously um, another fish that's considered invasive here in Florida. Can you tell us a little bit about this species and the work you did with it? So the walking catfish is initially from Southeast Asia. It's originally saw it as a thing as a species from like Indonesia or perhaps India, but the exact species is still, some people have debates, but it's right now it's known as the walking catfish Clarus petrachus. That's at least it's kind of the common knowledge. That's what we're all calling it right now. And I think they got introduced through the aquarium trade. People had them in their pets. They, they got out, they can breathe air, they can move on land. And Florida is basically one big flooded swamp. So they were able to spread through canals everywhere. And it could have also been released from aquaculture. People may have been farming them for food too. They do that around the world because it's really easy to take care of fish that can breathe air and don't really care about how bad your water quality is. And sometimes I was thinking, I did some experiments on the mummy chugs and the mangrove rivulets on their orientation. These fish have big eyes. The walking catfish have very small eyes, but I've seen some some people saying like, oh, they've seen them on land at night or they've seen them like feeding at night or, or similar species feeding on land at night. And I'm thinking if you're a fish with small eyes coming on land at night and fish out of water don't have the best vision in general, think of it like you going swimming without your goggles on, opening your eyes underwater. You could see kind of rough shapes and colors and stuff, but you're not going to be able to navigate. If it's completely dark and you're opening your eyes underwater with your goggles, you're not going to be able to find your way around well. And so I was thinking, can fish use chemoreception out of the water? Can they use taste and smell to find their way around on land? And if so, Walking catfish is the best candidate to do it because, well, first, it breathes air, walks around on land. It comes out at night with small eyes, but it's also got these sensory barbels, their whiskers that are coated in taste buds that they can move around, and their whole body's covered in taste buds. And so if there is a fish that could use chemoreception on land, I thought, it's probably the walking catfish. Well, let's find out, can they use chemoreception? Because it's thought that fish 
Like you need a moist surface to for fish to taste underwater. And so I'm thinking, oh, a fish on land is not going to be able to taste anything. And it's not going to smell anything because they can't move air through their nostrils. It's just all speculative stuff. Nobody ever, people just assume that fish couldn't do it because they're fish. They live in the water. And, but these, here these catfish are coming on land at night and sometimes feeding on land at night. And so it, it came down. Nobody let me bring these invasive species that aren't found in North Carolina up to North Carolina. So I reached out to Jeff at the, the lab with uh, where you are, uh, Jeff Hill, Dr. Jeff Hill. And He's like, come on down. I'll get a bunch of catfish for you. We can do some experiments. And that's where I met you uh, down in the facility where I'm doing my work in the greenhouses there and exposing these catfish to different, very simple chemical cues. Like I would just spray the ground with deionized water. They would move around randomly. And so it's like, okay, there, there's nothing in this greenhouse that's causing them to move in one direction on their own. Now, what if I spray half of that arena with L-alanine, which is an amino acid that has in other cat in like the channel catfish, it's shown the strongest positive taste response. They love it. Like they can't get enough of it. It's delicious. And so I found if I spray half the the arena with that, they prefer to move towards that side. And so that shows just very simple level. If they're in direct contact with this on a, on a slightly wet substrate, they can seems to be able to detect it and orient to that. And I did some other treatments too to kind of confirm that. But then some more interesting experiments I thought were. Some people were telling me like, oh, I would see these walking catfish leave this body of water on a sunny day where it's not wet out or anything like that. Move in a straight line, like a hundred feet, slightly uphill to like a cypress mound where there's standing water out of view, but it's upwind and they're moving a straight line upwind. And it's like, how could they know that body of water is there? They're waving their whiskers around on land. So maybe they can detect things in the air that's moving or just either gradients or just uh, the flow of compounds in the air use their whiskers to triangulate the source of it and move towards that. And so I did some simple experiments where basically I, I had these walking catfish in this arena. I had this little body of water they couldn't see, like it, like below this lip in this arena, where I would use filtered water with that you would assume have no chemicals or other like organic compounds you would find in the wild. And these catfish would move randomly. They didn't know that body of water was there. But if you dump that water out, you go outside to the pond, scoop up some water from there, or you scoop up some water from their fish tank where they're swimming in, whatever compounds are in there seem to have attracted them and they would move towards that water. So simply, it's a very simple experiment, but when you give them filtered water with nothing in it, they move randomly. But if you add chemicals into it, that influences their behavior, showing that they can use chemoreception to orient on land. And I'm still trying to separate out whether they're tasting the air to find their way around using their whiskers, or they are smelling with their organs that may be adapted to smell out of water that we haven't really looked, nobody's decided to look into yet because nobody thought that fish could detect chemicals out of the water. So it really opened up this wide door. And now I like, which, te like, now my next question is, I guess, which sense are they using? And then there's all sorts of more questions I can build off of that, but we just barely scratched the surface with that. And so I'm excited to do some more work with Walking Catfish. I think the other cool part of that, the work you did was looking at kind of social media and YouTube and how you were kind of trying to use some of the information that was out there. Maybe, uh, can you talk about that for a sec? Yeah. So when I was, for this project, I, I used social media in, in kind of a second afterthought where I had three weeks before the uh, I was scheduled to come down there. And I had nothing to do because I'm like, okay, I have fit all my other data is analyzed. And also I was recovering from shoulder surgery, so I couldn't really do anything other than like be on my laptop. So I figured I found this project. I started thinking about this project based on some posts somebody posted in a, a fishing group. I was in like, look at this walking catfish online. I'm like, what was the way? Like, oh, was it raining recently? Was it sunny out? What time of day it was? You saw this and they give me the information. That it, I might as well learn more about everybody's like people on Florida know like, Oh, like walking catfish come out in the summer when it floods. Like people will see them on land under all these conditions and they already know it, but it's not published anywhere. It's not compiled anywhere. And so sure, individuals may know it, but it's not really known well as a science. And if I were to go there and try to capture and see walking catfish out on, on land in the wild, I'd be looking around all the time scrambling, but I figured I might as well pull everybody who's already seen them and use mo much more eyes out there than my own to get more information. And so I just posted in all these wildlife and fishing related Facebook groups. I'm like, hey, I'm a fish biologist coming down to your neck of the woods in Florida. If you've seen a walking catfish, please let me know and tell me like what time of day it was. What was the weather like? Was it alone? Was it with other catfish? Any other noteworthy stuff? What time of year it was? Was the ground wet? Basic things like that. 
and people would be telling me things like, oh, yeah, here's all this time of day information I learned. And like, I learned things from that, such as like they mostly come on land during the rain and when it's wet out, which makes sense. They need water to survive, but not always. Like there is like sometimes they will come out when it hasn't rained for a few days. It's not the ground's not wet. But here you see this catfish on the ground. Other times, some of the information would be not quite what I was expecting, but very interesting. Unless I was like, was there a body of water nearby that you saw, like a visible body of water you saw? And two thirds of the people said no. Like, and all the comments, people in the kind of what else, like the kind of extra information section, people would say like, I would be in the it's, there's like a Payless Shoes parking lot in like Lakeland, Florida. I think is where the most observations were. Where like these fish are in the parking lot and they came out of nowhere. Or downtown Tampa, they come out of nowhere. I kept thinking like these fishing are coming out of nowhere mostly around concrete areas and stuff like that. And I started looking at YouTube videos and all this stuff. And I'd see like people are like, oh, it's a rainy day or it's like the sun's coming up and the ground's still wet. We see some catfish in the street and they're kind of piled around storm jang grates a little bit. And I'm like, see, I'm thinking. And I kept seeing another, other video. They're all like 17 or 20 videos or so. They're near storm drain grates. People are saying they're coming out of nowhere around concrete. And Florida is, is different than most states for a variety of reasons. But also because there's like no topography. It's very flat. So the storm drain system there, there's always standing water. And the standing water gets moved out by more water that comes in, pushes that water out. Does not like, let's say you're somewhere in the mountains, the water just runs downhill, eventually gets to a river and gets to the ocean. It just stays there. And so there's always a body of water that, let's say these catfish during a, a flood, got a hurricane, they're swimming around in the streets. The water recedes into the storm drains. The catfish follow the flow of water into the storm drains. But then there's water for them to survive. And so they're moving. It seems like they move around underground throughout the uh, between floods. And then when it rains, the water from the surface gets connected to the storm drain grates. They swim out of storm drain grates and they move around in the parking lots. And so I learned that from some of these observations. But I also learned something. One guy happened to respond. He's like, I'm a USGS wildlife technician. And I saw a hundred of them in a road while I was driving home at night. And said, I'm going to get some dinner. I'm going to take 50 of these catfish, put them in a, my truck, drive home. But he noticed a lot of worms like, earthworms that come out of the ground when it's wet out on the land around these catfish. He got home and he, he filleted these catfish for dinner and decided to check the stomachs and found that half of them had those worms in their stomachs. Like not like a parasite, but as in they were eating these worms. And so it shows like, oh, it seems like these catfish could taste chemicals in the flooded landscape, the wet landscape with your whiskers, coat and taste buds. They can move them around to triangulate and find these worms and then eat those worms while they're on land. And so that social media survey was very helpful. And I thought it was kind of fitting because that project was funded by, I guess, a crowdfunded grant that uh, through like the uh, through experiment.com, like animal superpowers grant. People tried to help me raise money for this project. And so it's kind of fitting that people helped me raise money for their project. And then people helped me collect the data for their project as well. It was kind of bringing the whole community involved. Then I got to share this information back with all those Facebook groups that reached out and all these people were like, wow, it's cool to see that my observations help inform this research. No, that is great. And because they helped you, I assume you gave them some of the money back as well. I'm, I'm just kidding. I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so I, I did want to talk about at least one more fish. And uh, because obviously plecos are a big part of the aquarium industry uh, and you came up with a new fancy word for how they walk. Why don't you go ahead and tell, uh, tell us a little bit about plecos. Maybe again, I think most people know what a pleco is, you know, kind of the generic common name for this group, but maybe uh, talk a little bit about biology as well. Plecos or plecos or sucker fish, sailfin armored catfish, whatever you want to call them. They're those fish you go into any, see any fish tank and they're sucking on the side of the glass, cleaning the algae. That's what they are. And there's super diverse. There's hundreds and hundreds of, of species of them. I've done some projects on studying the soft tissue of their mouth before. But, and they're, they're another invasive species in Florida that were introduced in the aquarium trade. They, people think they're cute. They're like three inches long when they buy them. They help clean the algae. And then a year later, they're a foot and a half long and they can't fit them in their fish tank. So they're like, I'll just let them go outside. And that's how a lot of invasive species around the world start, where it just takes a few people releasing them. But so they're around in Florida. And during that survey, one person's like, oh, here's like a photo of a, a white catfish I took on land. And oh, that's a, not a white catfish, that's a pleco. But is that photo is on land, like maybe a bird dropped it or something like that. I don't know. And then while I was doing work at the Tropical Aquaculture Lab down with you, somebody came into the greenhouse doing a walk catfish experiment to, uh, to yell at me. It's like, 
we, we let you come here and do your research here, but you let your invasive walking catfish outside. Like, please don't do that. Otherwise, we're not going to let you come back here because we can't let these invasive species escape. I'm, like, I'm so sorry. I'll go outside and collect it. I go outside. I'm like, that's not a walking catfish. That's not one of mine. That's just a, a pleco that's out on this ground here. And I'm like, huh, this got me thinking. So it's not just that one instance. They're not as common as walking catfish, but here's another one on the land. This one was dead and it was about 30, 40 feet away from a pond, but it was on the land. And they do have an air breathing organ. Like they can breathe air through their gut and their armor would help them prevent water loss from evaporating through the skin. So like they could survive on land. And so I am set up to study how amphibious fish move around on land here. I have all my equipment here. Let me quickly get a approval from the animal care committee, which somehow I got it done in two days, which is if you, if you, any of you have done with an IACA committee, it usually doesn't take two days. That's like a record speed. And I was like, oh, great. I'm approved to do these experiments now because I'm already working with other amphibious fish that breathe there. I put an eye on the ground and I'm like, whoa, these things can move really quickly. But then I did some other experiments where I was like putting them, like filming with high speed cameras, filming them from underneath, looking at like what parts of body come in contact when, things like that. And so I was doing that and noticed that they're not moving in a typical way for anything, like a fish move on land or anything. Like they're moving in an asymmetric way where they're swinging their tail to one side and the tail was sw- like the, based on the face, the tail wasn't pushing against the ground. They were moving more when the tail flings forward. So it seems like it was at least partially inertial base where like a kid on, pumping their legs back and forth on a swing, they're swinging their tail forward and then slowly resetting and then swinging their tail forward to help them move forward. The larger ones seem to be able to push against it, the, use their tail more to push against the ground. The smaller ones were almost exclusively flinging based. And they're also using their mouth where they put their mouth down for half the movement and then not the other half of the movement, but only on one side. And they're only using like the fins on the pectoral and pelvic fin on one side of the body to move and they rotate around those. So, like they plant their mouth down, they rotate around those fins, then they lift their mouth up and their fins up and swing their tail forward. And they plant their mouth back down, push out with their fins to rotate forward and they repeat like that. And so it's a really just bizarre behavior, asymmetric. And you think any asymmetric behavior to, to move on land, let's say you move your leg one more, let's say you move your leg more, one your left leg more than your right leg when you walk, you'll just walk in circles. If a fish does swim, moves their tail more to one side, they'll swim in circles. But these fish are moving in a straight line. And so they're just doing something so bizarre that's so unlike any other way of moving around that we had to create a new word to describe what they're doing because we can't call it like a modified crawl or modified walk because it's not even in the ballpark of a crawl or a walk. And so we're bouncing around idea names of me and my uh, advisor, Dr. Ashley Ross at Wake Forest. And the name we settled on was like, it seems like they repetitively fling their tail forward. So let's call it ruffling, short for repetitive flinging. And so I got to create a new word, which is cool. Like, when else do you get to create a new word? I'm like, I got to create a new word and hopefully we'll see it in the dictionary. So y'all have to start using that word. So make, make it common knowledge. You're like, oh, you see that Pleco ruffling down the street the other day? It'll only be a, used in very specific contexts, it seems like. But this behavior is possible partially because well, exclusively because they have this really rigid armor all around their body. And then they have these weird bones that cause their pectoral and pelvic fins to lock up, reducing the range of motion. I CT scanned them and saw that these bones, this bone called a lateral pterygium, it's only found in this group of catfish, have this bone that connects to their armor, and then their armor connects through like their vertebral column, through these weird paraneural arches that are in, that mo- a paraneural spines, whereas most fish only have one neural spine, and there's all sorts of these weird interlocking skeletal things going on that both restrict their mobility so that it seems like they if they wanted to move like another fish over land, they physically could not. They are physically constrained into only being able to move in this way to move over land. But because of that, because their body can only move in a certain way, they're not losing excess force going out in other directions. Their force is transmitted very directly through their body to the ground with like with limited wasteful force being used. So because of that, they can move very effectively in this way. And like some of them, you know, like the, the highest burst I got one was moving over a meter per second over land. So over like two miles per hour, mind you for like a second, but that's still a fish moving two miles per hour in a, in a, over land in a second. And overall, their speed is still the highest among any amphibious fish, but they do it in such a weird way. And you wouldn't think of it from these heavy armored fish. They do slow over time, though, because they're so armored, but because they can breathe air, they can move around over longer times. But the interesting thing is nobody really sees them on land at all, unless a bird drops them on land or a person catches them because let's say you have like a heron or a cormorant tries to eat them. They're very armored. They're very spiny. They'll try. Sometimes they get them down. Sometimes they can't get them down. They just drop them on land wherever they are. Or you'll have people 
who catch in their cast net, they tear holes in their cast net because of all their spines. They get angry, but they know that this fish is an invasive species. So they're trying to do their part by just curling it into the bushes, being like, you're not going back in that water. You're not going to destroy the water because they have harmful effects in the ecosystem and they cause erosion by burrowing the riverbanks and things like that. So they think they're helping, but they don't know that these fish can breathe air and move around on land. And I guess the birds don't really care about that either. They just don't find them that appetizing if they can't swallow them. And so these predators are introducing these fish that normally won't really come onto land, at least not in the scenarios I've seen. And they're putting them onto land, but these fish can then have an opportunity to move over land to disperse to a new body of water where they can then inhabit and expand their population. So that's something to consider in that some of these fish that are amphibious, they may not voluntarily come onto their own unless like a predator chases them onto land or brings them onto land. But once on land, they can then move to a new body of water and establish their population through that. That is great. And yeah, ruffling, I, I, I have used that word a couple of times, just FYI. So uh, just so you know. <laughs> we'll we'll have to <laughs> That's make right. it catch on. So while we're, we're running out of time, I did want to at least mention two quick things. And maybe you can do like a 30 second or one minute thing on each. You've got some uh, really cool hobbies, including uh, obviously the, your art, but also your uh, your fish life list. Uh, may, maybe uh, t- tell us a little bit about that to get outside of the the science a little bit. It gets started through science. It's a method called clearing and staining, where you stain certain tissues, certain colors, like with certain chemicals. And so you like bones will be red, cartilage will be blue. And then you just use other chemicals to get rid of all the other tissue that you don't want. And so you get these pretty images of these bright skeletons, great for studying anatomy, like, oh, where are the bones? There's all the bones. But I realized in grad school, art's expensive. So I might as well print these out to decorate my walls. And then I, my friends like, oh, I want, I want some prints. And like these restaurants like, oh, I want to put these prints up in a gallery. I, like, oh, can you put your work up in this gallery? I'm like, okay, if you want to buy my artwork, sure. And then I started realizing, oh, I guess I'm an artist now. But then I was like thinking, I was like, and I was having fun making this art to begin with and sharing this. And I started using Photoshop techniques to create like stories with the fish and started like actually turning it more from science into a little bit of pop art. And But it's a great way I found to, for science communication, because people see this pretty image like, whoa, what's going on there? And I'm like, well, let me give you a science lesson about this method called clearing and staining and how it's used in my research. And so you can check out that site, uh, that stuff at my website, my gallery at noahbressman.wixsite.com slash Noah. We can just Google me and or Noah with fish is where I'm on social media and that'll all pop up and you can find it through there. Uh, as for fishing, I just really like fishing and the biologist of me likes diversity of fish. And so I like just catching as many types of fish as I can. And I decided I'm going to create a list of all the fish species that I catch and I've caught. And then I found out there's it's, it's actually a thing that other people do. It's called lifeless fishing, where you create a lifeless of all the species you've caught. And so I just do it in a friendly way. Some people take it more competitively and have their own very specific rules. Like you can't have a fishing guide take you, otherwise it doesn't count. And I'm like, I'm just doing it for fun for me. So I'm, I, I do whatever rules I want to do. And I just want to see how many different fish I can catch, how many species I can see up close, interact with in the wild, just to see a small fraction of the fish diversity out there. And so well, uh, last week I got my 446 species on hook and line, a banded rudderfish, which is a type of small amberjack um, that's found along the East Coast. And that was cool. I use it as a way to, on social media, just kind of do fun facts about fish. Like, here's a quick fun fact about this fish that I caught, X, Y, and Z, it's a small social media post, and it's a good way to just communicate about the fish diversity out there get people interested in like oh get them out of fishing just for bass or trout like oh look at this cool giant pike minnow that gets like five feet long in the mountains of california like oh that's cool i might as well go for that try something new and just want to show people there's other fish out there explore see what's out there try to put on small hooks when there's no fish big fish are biting i might as well get small little colorful minnows it's a just might as well get something and they're also shows you what's out there that's great well, unfortunately, we're out of time. I want to thank my guest, Noah Bressman, and our producer, Mark Winter, for making this show possible. Noah, do you have any uh, final thoughts or words of wisdom? Just pay attention to what's out you. You never know when you're going to see a fish on the ground in a hallway and start asking questions or a pleco on the ground outside of a lab or another fish on the ground or even something that's not a fish on the ground. Just pay attention and make observations. And, and if you have a good question, follow it through and try to answer your question. You never know what you're going to find from that. Great advice. Thanks again, Noah. And uh, please be sure to check out Noah's web links. Noah, you know, make sure uh, we'll grab your web links and put them on your um, page on uh, Aquarium Mania, your guest page. Until next time, visit your local aquarium stores, keep your tanks clean and your animals healthy. And again, be sure to check out Noah's videos and blogs and web links. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.